caregivers, whether you're caring for the young, the older, or those in between, have one thing in common. We don't have enough time for ourselves. And odds are, if we do have some spare time, it's unlikely we spend it on our health. Our generally busy schedules are most often the obstacles that prevent us from adopting healthy lifestyles. Thank you for joining us on The Confident Patient in a New World. I'm Beth Myers, founder of 2x2 Health and co-author of The Confident Patient. Co-hosting with me is my colleague and co-author, Wendy Benson. Back with us today are our very own 2x2 Health dietitians, Kim and Kristen. We spoke with you both a short time ago about nutrition and healthy lifestyle goals and how individualized that, real, that really is for each of us. And today, you're back to talk about eating healthy as a family, especially when you're on the go, being torn in 12 di different directions. Wendy, you know just as well as many of us how this goes. Take it from here. Thanks so much, Beth. And Kim and Kristen, we're both, we're just so pleased to have you both with us here today. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, Kim, I'm going to start with you. Um, there are so many things that we read, so many things that we hear about, um, you know, things that we can do to influence ourselves to be, have a healthier lifestyle. What are two or three things that you can share with us that are really something that we can all um, take some advice on, on how we can have a healthier lifestyle? Oh my gosh, that's such a great question. And it's, it's so overwhelming to try to, when you're trying to make changes in your, in your health or your family's routine, to go from like here to wanting to be perfect. And what we frequently tell our patients and our loved ones is don't expect to go from where you are to where you imagine yourself being overnight. So um, the most important things that I stress for my family, my loved ones, my patients and myself are food is fuel, movement is key and stress and sleep really do have a huge part to play in this story. And if you don't have all of these things working together, if even one thing is off like poor quality sleep or you're really worried about someone, I mean, these are stressful times, then it can send your whole cycle just down a really dirty path. So usually we start by asking patients um, to collect some data on themselves. You can't really go down the path and, and go on your journey unless you know more about yourself and more about your habits. So we collect data. We do the fun stuff. I always ask my patients and try myself to track. Um, downloading an app for mindfulness, whether it be food tracking or a lot of people have Apple watches these days and get a lot of information that way. And they can really see what's going on from a different perspective because we all have ideas about our habits, but what's really going on might be a little bit different. So tracking and collecting data is usually where I ask people to start. And then the second habit that you can incorporate once you know some information about yourself is planning um, and preparing, whether it be planning your one exercise class that you're gonna to get to this week or planning a way to make your sleep go a little bit better by having a bath a few evenings you know, during the week or planning one meal that you're gonna make. So we track, we plan, and then we try to implement slowly and surely over time. But really important for your patients and my patients to know that the expectation is never to be perfect. Can't go from where you are to being perfect um, ever. So it's definitely a journey and be patient with yourself. Great. That's such great advice. It is. You know, we, I worked with a patient once who was a bariatric patient and she told me she would drink, <clears throat> excuse me, three Tahitian, like two liter bottles a day. And I was like, if we could just maybe drink, just drink one of those a day. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it would be perfect not to drink any Tahitian treat, but is that an alcoholic drink because it sounds delicious. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> it is, I don't know about just a lot of sugar. <laughs> it's a ton of sugar, yeah. And that is like the the very basic most behavior change um, thing that we do with sugary drinks is if someone's drinking a liter of soda or Tahitian goodness, we usually ask just to reduce, reduce, reduce instead of going cold turkey because if you go cold turkey, you're going to mess up your brain. And we don't want to do that either because we don't have anyone. <laughs> well, and it just seems so much more manageable that way, right? Instead of thinking I'm going from something to nothing, being like, oh, I can cut it back a third. You know, I can cut it back a half. Um, so I love that. And these are real behavior change principles that people, we don't talk about enough, um, you know, with diet culture and everything with social media and 
on the news, you're just given like really strict sort of expectations. And the reality is, is that behavior change takes time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing why we like to focus on behavior changes versus the crash diets you see in the media, because those are something that might, you might be able to cut everything out for a day or a week, but it's not really sustainable for a long-term lifestyle. So that's why we really do work on behavior modifications and starting small and then kind of working our way towards um, whatever our patient or client's goals are. That's a great point, Kristen. And it really segues into my next question that I was going to ask you is that as um, we care for our loved ones, uh, you know, whether that be our kids, our parents, people in our community, ourselves, like how do we be sure to carve out and remember to take time to care for ourselves as well? That's a good question. And that's honestly a hard question. I feel like as caregivers, as parents, as spouses, um, we always kind of put others' needs ahead of ours, um, mm -hmm. which is something that is very difficult. But it is important to remember to take, take time for yourself and that you really truly can't give your best to others and care for others if you are not um, feeling good yourself. So um, I would recommend just trying to carve out, even if it's small periods of time, five to 10 minutes throughout the day, to just really take time for yourself and think about that's going to mean something different for everyone. So if that means kind of sitting in a quiet room and just decompressing, if that means reading a book, um, doing some kind of meditation, or there's all these different calming apps out there, um, there's multiple different things to do, but really trying to prioritize yourself, which I know is very difficult, um, but prioritize yourself and then kind of carving in those specific time slots throughout the day so that you're never feeling really completely drained and always giving yourself that time to kind of rebuild and re- um, re basically figure, figure things out for the rest of the day then and kind of give you that motivation to keep going. Which yeah, that's excellent. Right, to Dr. Perella when she said you need to recharge just like your phone, you know, you got to plug it in. Yes. And we don't give that idea enough credit in this 24 seven sort of society that we live in. Right. Your body and your brain cannot heal itself if it's not given a night um, or a moment to just uh, sort of rest. I think Deep breathing exercises is something that we that we do a lot in behavior change and psychology. Um, my, the psychologist I work with, and and also like yoga practicing. I think for deep breathing is really like key. <laughs> Makes me want to take some deep breaths right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I mean that just you know, and so when we think about if someone's has twenty minutes, thirty minutes where they don't have anything scheduled at that time, for the two of you, like what is how is your time best spent? If you have 30 minutes of unscheduled time, what do you choose to do to make best use of that for your healthy lifestyles? I would love to say that I light a candle and I take some deep breaths <laughs> and I meditate. I um, the reality is that I'm probably scrolling through something silly on my phone. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but it does allow my brain to relax. So um, instead of like scrolling through like an IG or Facebook feed, I have some cooking videos that I save and I go and I watch. There's these amazing people online that there's like, they like cook in the wild and I don't even know, it's just crazy. It's very peaceful. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to say that I do really intentional things, but um, I, Usually I don't, but it's something that I'm working on. I think that uh, the, one of the most healthful, healthy behaviors that I've done, that we've done in our family is get a dog that um, he does force us to go walk because he will ask for it and so he'll beg. And that walking has changed my life being, I work in a sedentary sort of role, which is unfortunate, but was sitting for many, many, many years. And the dog was the stimulus to get me to walk. Um, and I don't think without the dog that it, I don't think it would have been the same. So um, I'm obviously biased towards dogs, but maybe people can walk their cats too or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of my uh, counseling with my patients is like, okay, can you take a walk around the block? Could you have 10 minutes to take a walk around the block? Because that can really clear your mind. So walking is really a good one. And, I, and I'm striving for taking a few moments of taking some deep breath. But for me, what works is looking at a really relaxing cooking video on, on the, uh, on social media. What about you, Kristen? 
I would say kind of piggybacking off what Kim said is getting your body moving. I remember there was a time where I used to think it was only a workout if I was in the gym for an hour, running on a treadmill, lifting heavy weights and things like that. But in reality, that's not not um, really feasible every day and that's not feasible in most people's life. So I would say just getting your body moving, whatever that means for you, if that means walking your dog like Kim, if that means just getting up, getting outside, getting some fresh air or doing a, a short yoga video now, um, there's so many different workouts and things you can do online and right in your phone. So, or right on your phone or um, in your home. And it's just nice to kind of even for 10 to 20 minutes to get your body moving, not only from a physical health standpoint, but it also kind of helps with what we were talking about before. It helps clear your mind and kind of get you feeling, feeling good. So moving your body in whatever way looks good and feels comfortable for you, I think is really beneficial, especially when you have just short periods of time. All right, so it would be awesome if we all had all the, these um, huge blocks of unscheduled time. But as we know, realistically, many times we're like running home from work, trying to do a million things at one time. Kristen, what advice do you have, practical tips for if everybody's rushing in the house, nobody's had time to do anything about dinner yet, someone's opening a bag of chips, somebody has a bag of something sugary over there. Like what advice do you have for those of us that, um, are living on the fly much of the time. <laughs> I would say that's very typical for most of us, right? <laughs> Always kind of on the go. Um, but I would say two of the tips I have would be to kind of plan ahead with meals and snacks and also get comfortable with leftovers. Um, so what I mean by that is um, sitting down and planning out either a couple days worth of meals or a week's worth of meals. And I know for most of us, it's really hard to sit down and cook three healthy meals every single day. Um, so what I typically recommend is that people cook larger batches of meals meals um, so that they're able to have the leftovers either for lunch or for dinner the following day. So if you know that, say, your Tuesday is going to be super busy, maybe making a larger amount for dinner on Monday and then have packaging everything up and putting it in the refrigerator. So that way, when you're running in from your appointment or running in from work, instead of grabbing a bag of chips or some cookies, that way you have your dinner already all set for you. You just need to grab it and throw it right in the microwave or um, even eat it cold, kind of depending on what types of things you have but planning ahead also really helps. So that way you're not kind of just coming home and then thinking, oh, I don't even know what I'm gonna make for dinner. Um, so planning a couple days or a week ahead and then also working with those leftovers if possible. Yeah, that's great advice. I hate that feeling when like everybody's like really ready for something to eat and nobody has any ideas on what we're going to do. Or and you're just like scrounging through the cabinets. Like, exactly. Well, yep. <laughs> so planning is incredibly important in that preparation. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, what other professionals and resources do can we tap into to maintaining a more healthy lifestyle? Yeah, in terms of online resources, um, shout out to uh, the registered dietitians. We have a really great website called Eating, <laughs> called, I'm sorry, I like can't even remember it now because I have a few, eatright.org. So this is um, a really good website, uh, user friendly, full of um, nutrition information that's supported by the research. Um, so eatright.org. Um, this is what our professionals as dietitians go to for patient education handouts and resources. Um, so it's full of recipes and, and ideas and also a good education, um, easily understandable. And then eatingwell.com, lots of eating, um, lots of food stuff. Eatingwell.com is such a great resource for healthy um, meals. Uh, so many recipes with a lot of different like diet prescriptions, right? Like if you have, if you need to follow like a low salt diet for your heart health for some reason, or if you need a kidney friendly um, meal plan, um, you will find all of those options under eating well. And, um, you know, back to Kristen's question, I really have started to rely a lot on my crock pot. And there are some really great healthy crock pot recipes that do not have a lot of junk in them. It's basically just proteins and vegetables and some type of like yogurt or whatever. And a lot of those recipes I find, I get mine on, on um, eatingwell.com or eatright.org. Great, we'll have to check those out, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen, when we were talking about, you know, the family converging and everybody trying to figure out what we're gonna do for dinner, when you talked about like preparing and planning and that kind of a thing, what do we do if like some of our family members are like all in on this idea and some of our family members are like, mm, I'm 
not sure I'm ready to do something different yet. I kind of like going for the chips and the cookies when I come home. I'm thinking about some of I'm thinking about some kids that I know. Um, what is your advice to kind of get everybody on the same page with uh, uh, with a healthy plan? <laughs> well, it is very important. I know sometimes it can be difficult, but it is important to kind of have the whole family on board. And what I would suggest is starting with a young age. So if you even have young children, getting them involved in the cooking process and helping them, um, having them help you prepare meals or pick out what type of foods they're going to eat. There have actually been studies showing that um, exposure to fruits and vegetables and a variety of foods when kids are very young leads to um, a more variety of foods and a healthier diet later in life. So I would suggest if you have young kids, grade school kids, or even high school kids, getting them um, involved to help you cook and kind of work on those things. Now, if we're talking more with spouses or adults or parents, um, sometimes that's a little bit harder to get them kind of included, but I would recommend if possible, sitting down as a family and kind of going back to that preparation and that meal planning idea, having everyone at the table and able to kind of give their advice about what they like. So then that way you don't have people complaining like, oh, I don't want to eat this. You can have everybody's, um, everybody's opinions kind of on that meal plan. Um, so getting them involved and if possible, going to the grocery store as a family and kind of working on picking out different items and things like that. But um, also with adults, it's important to emphasize, you know, we're working on our own health, but we want to stay healthy as a family. And it's much easier to do when you do have the support of your family members. So just trying to get buy-in and getting people involved in as much of the process as possible. We also yeah. know that what's available to people to eat is what they will eat. So if your house um, is full of one type of food or the, or the other, if it's full of snack foods, people are going to eat those snack foods. But if it's full of nutrient dense vegetables prepared in many different ways, um, even like dehydrated veggie chips that you can buy these days, fruits, um, the people in your house are going to eat those foods because that's what's available to them. And that's backed by lots of years of science. Mm -hmm. I still don't do it, but so true. <laughs> <laughs> so work in progress. I know the best progress. It's a work in progress. <laughs> Kim already told us we can't go from one stage to instant. Right, person. right. So yeah. that's all. <laughs> Just get one bag of carrots. And <laughs> Kim, we know a healthy lifestyle extends beyond our physical well-being. We know that it's such it plays such an important part on our mental health as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about why that's so important for us? Oh my gosh, that is like the Pandora's box of all questions. And I love being asked it and I appreciate that. Um, nothing can happen without good nutrition, right? You're, you're born and, and everything, even before you're born, when you're being grown um, it, as a baby, it, it all comes to nutrition. So nutrition feeds your brain and feeds the rest of your body. And the tie-in between nutrition and mental health is something that be, is being really looked at more now in a in sort of a global um, sense and a really um, larger sense. You know, we used to think that like one nutrient, like oh, if you're deficient in this nutrient, maybe you have a risk for this or that. But really, it's a lot more complicated because of the food matrix that we have. All of these nutrients play a part together. The fat that you eat in your diet can be really important for the fat that's in your brain. And the vitamins and minerals that you get from your fruits and vegetables are really important for preventing cancer um, and other you know, functions in your body. So it starts and it ends with food. And I was doing a little bit of research for our, um, for our talk today and I was looking at some mental health um, stuff online and there's, uh, I was reading this table of essential vitamins and minerals and the effects where we find them in their deficiency effect on the brain sometimes. And a lot of these nutrients can cause depression. So if you're deficient in B1, B3, B5, B6, B12, vitamin C, you can have memory loss, you can have depression, you can have, um, you know, tiredness, fatigue. And a lot of those nutrients are found in vegetables. The list is vegetables, whole grains, vegetables, whole grains, vegetables, whole grains, eggs, fish, dairy, meat. So they're found in common places. Um, but I do encourage people to kind of lean into the idea that that nutrition can help the entire body, including the brain. Um, and that's why we ask patients and, and loved ones and other professionals to try to eat a, an unprocessed diet. So what does a healthy diet mean? We always come back to this question. Well, what does it mean? What should I be eating? 
And you should, we should all try to be eating as much unprocessed food as possible. Um, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, any type of plant, um, lean proteins, healthy fats. And usually these are coming in forms of that, you know, are not boxed and bagged and things that might go bad on the, on the, you know, in the refrigerator eventually. So fresh foods if possible or um, unprocessed foods. So that is the, that is the key because all the processing of the food can really, um, there's a lot of chemicals added to it that can really kind of go to your, go to the brain too and cause a lot of inflammation. So that is a very poor answer for a very complex question, but <laughs> just the, the point is, is that um, nutrition affects all part of your body, including, and probably most especially your brain. All right, well, Kim and Kristen, thank you so much for once again joining us today. For me, the greatest takeaway was talking about um, the importance of uh, good nutrition on the brain. And I, it's so easy to eat the, the wrong food, but it, you guys always hit it home for me that I need to start being a better eater. So thank you. And you had a lot of great websites too that we'll have posted here. Um, you can learn more about um, healthy lifestyle services on our website at 2 by 2 healthcom healthy living. In the meantime, be sure to check back with us as Wendy and I continue our conversation with medical experts as we help the confident patient in a new world. And from all of us at 2 by 2 Health, we wish you great confidence and health. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much. Thank you.